Yeah, as you have seen, the title of my message today is Domesticized Church. Uh, you will understand why I titled my sermon uh, like this as we uh, go further, as we discuss about the topic, then you will be able to relate to this title. History of humanity is full of bloodshed and violence. Any history you take, the history teachers can help us understand. You know, all the history will be like so-and-so year, so-and-so war took place, so-and-so person won over so-and-so kingdom. All the history was about this violence. And sometimes it is with the wars, sometimes it is with civil wars, Sometimes it will be uh, a particular group was uh, expressing their anger or hatred towards another group. Sometimes majorities are showing hatred towards minorities and have shed uh, their blood. So if you read the history, all the history stories will be some or other of this sort, okay? Or sometimes some powerful people sacrificing the weak people and uh, that, that, that has been written in the history. Sometimes those sacrifices are willful. Sometimes, uh, so most of the times those sacrifices are forced. So if you read the history from the beginning of humanity, we understand that it is full of bloodshed and violence. And as a civilization was growing and the same violence has been systemized and two institutes came out of it. One is politics, the other one is religion. And read the history. All these violences were took place because of these two matters, either because of politics or because of religion. So the entire civilization has suffered by these systemization, systemized violence, which we call politics and religion. And uh, a Catholic Pope, Pope Galatius, number one, Pope Galatius one in 580, he said like this, there are two powers by which the world is chiefly ruled, the sacred authority of the priesthood and the authority of the kings. In other words, he is saying there are two major powers in the world. Number one is sacred authority, which is religion and the political authority he is talking about. So always the history was crushed, humans were suffered under these two institutions. The whole history was written by the bloodshed by these two institutes and they still continue doing it. Even look at now, they look at the countries around us and so sometimes in our own country, how the violence is taking place. It would be definitely from these two institutes only. And if you look at any incident in the history where these two institutes have together ex expressed their hatred, together they have released their poison is in the life of Jesus. But the cross of Jesus won the victory over these two through the resurrection of Jesus. We have discussed about the uh, domesticized cross last time, how the cross has been domesticized. And we have discussed about the power of the cross. We can understand the power of the cross only when we look at the cross through the resurrection. And in the cross, we have seen the, power, the political power of Roman empire, which was... Uh, represented by Pontius Pilate and religious authority of Jewish religion, represented by Sadducees. They have unleashed their violence. They have unleashed their hatred. They have unleashed their poison. And they expressed everything on one single person, that is Jesus, and they have murdered him. But the divine judge did not let these two institutes have the final word. And he rose Jesus from the dead. And now the cross of Jesus is hanging on top of both religious institutions as well as the pol political institutions. 
that's how jesus won the victory over these two institution and has said that this violence cannot have the final word and he won the victory over them and one example we can see in the scripture very clearly how these two institutes they tried their best to stop jesus that is after the death of jesus we can uh, we can see it in matthew chapter 27 verse 62 to 66 it is about uh, the, the burial of jesus christ you know uh, i'm reading from nkjv translation the next day the one of the preparation day the chief priest and the pharisees went to pilate sir they said we remember uh, we remember that while he was still alive the deceiver said after 3 days i will raise again so give the order for the tomb to be made secure until the third day otherwise his disciples may come and steal the body and tell the people that he has been raised from the dead this last deception will be worse than the first take a guard pilate answered go make the tomb as secure as you know how so they went and made the tomb secure by putting seal on the stone and putting the guards so i i just wonder at the faith of these sadducees or pharisees than the disciples none of the disciples expected that jesus may raise again from the dead they were with him for 3 and 1/2 years they didn't expect but it's so great that these hey, people who hate jesus they have better faith than uh, the disciples they were worried that they jesus may raise again from the dead so at any cost we need to stop it so they went and took the support from the political leader uh, political <coughs> representative pilot and they asked him to seize the tomb so that even if jesus rose again from the dead also he may not be able to come and this issue can be solved once for all and they tried their best to suppress him suppress his revolution and uh, they put a seal on the tomb of jesus christ and they put guards also uh at the poor at the tomb of jesus christ and you all know very well the plots of this religion and politics uh, came up with have become the proofs of power of god though this uh, tomb was sealed jesus broke it and came out of it and the seal itself which was supposed to suppress jesus has become the proof of his power and the guards they were surprised they were supposed to uh, kill this revolution even if jesus rise again from the dead to protect him uh, to protect the religion and politics they have become the witnesses of god's power that's how god got victory that's how jesus got victory over the powers of this world and we could see its power very uh, very strongly and we all know very well that there is power in the name of jesus we all discuss uh, talk about it there is power in the name of jesus right and philippians also uh, says that in, in uh, chapter 2 verse 9 to 11 therefore god exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name that at the name of jesus every knee should bow in in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue acknowledge that jesus christ is the lord to the glory of god the father god has given him the highest name the powerful name in the world at his name every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess this is this is um, uh, what we'll call uh, uh, this is this is god has decided for jesus and this is what god has decided for the entire creation that they have to bow at the foot of jesus christ why it is just because of one simple thing that it's because of jesus humility jesus submitted himself to this violence of these institutes the violence of humanity and he has broken it uh, through his resurrection and he has revealed the power of god through this act and now because he has revealed that through his act of resurrection god had given him the name above all names 
so there is power in the name of jesus sometimes we do think that the power of the power in the name of jesus uh, will be appeared when any demon possessed person come people try to scream the name of jesus so that the demon can leave let me tell you my brethren the power in the power of the name of jesus does not lie in the sound jesus if any sick person come no matter how loudly you shout the name of jesus he is not going to be healed if a demon possessed person comes it's no matter how loudly you shout the name of jesus and make that sound he is not going to be healed <coughs> the power of the name of jesus does not lie in the sound but the power of the name of jesus lies in the very message that he shared as he lived in this world and the power in the name of power in the name of jesus that lies not in the sound but it lies in the very act of his death burial and resurrection and his words of forgiveness it's not in the sound having said that we also believe that there is power in the blood of jesus we very we speak about it so very much but let me remind you my brethren the power in the blood of jesus does not lie in its biological quality there is no power in the biological blood of jesus and there are a lot of people who misunderstand uh, uh, there is power in the biological blood of jesus and they do things uh, so many various uh, uh, sometimes it can be uh, the elements used in the eucharist and so many things they have literally turned into blood they have literally turned into uh, meat in such a way they do speak about it please do not be deceived by them the power is not in the biological blood of jesus but the power of blood of jesus lies in the very message it carries that is you and i are forgiven forever god has taken our violence and has him say he did not get back to us and he did not return us with violence back but he returned to us with forgiveness that is where the power of blood of jesus lies in the in the very message that the blood carries and having said that let me put this question in your uh, in front of you is there power in the body of christ we said there is power in the name of christ there is power in the blood of christ if there is power in the name of christ and the power in the blood of christ is there power in the body of christ what do you say we'll discuss about it i would like to bring before you one example from the uh, early church and then i will i'll try to connect it to the modern day situation the scripture portion the scripture portion read to us by hasni is from john 20 what's 19 to 23 this is a very well known scripture to all of us jesus after his resurrection he appeared to his disciples and this particular uh, incident uh, is very dramatic in its nature and uh, if you read it it has a very great depth and very great meaning inside it so john chapter 20 verse 19 to 23 here it is written on the evening uh, so before that let me tell you and john did not speak about a uh, great commission as the other apostles speak in matthew there is great commission in matthew 28 in mark there is great commission in mark uh, mark 16 and in at the same time even in luke there is a great commission but in the gospel of john there is no great commission as such but this particular conversation has been taken as a, taken as part of a great commission having said that let us look into this very situation john chapter 20 verse 19 to 23 on the evening of the first day of the week when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the jewish leaders jesus came and stood among them and said peace be with you after he said this he showed them his hands and side the disciples were overjoyed when they saw the lord again jesus said peace be with you 
as the father has sent me i am sending you and with with that he breathed on them and said receive the holy spirit if you forgive anyone's sin their sins are forgiven if you do not if you do not forgive them they are not forgiven this is the dramatic incident that took place after the resurrection of jesus let us look at few things few interesting points we can find in this scripture number 1 is jesus entered the room with closed uh, doors okay what does it signify the closed doors of course we closed our doors uh, it's because outside it is hot we we switched on our aces that's why we closed the doors but what does the closed door signify closed door signify fear and a heart that has been troubled so they were scared of the jewish people and so they closed their doors and they were hiding inside and into that closed doors without opening the door jesus entered that is a surprising thing for them and through which he is expressing a message to them no matter what fears you are surrounded by no matter how you are and where you are no matter how troubled your heart is let me tell you these fears may stop you they cannot stop me i am with you in your fears he did not say directly don't be afraid first thing he did was he just entered into very situation do you remember this incident where jesus was walking on the water okay the uh, the disciples were sailing and there was a storm and the disciples were troubled i was always wondering this why don't jesus fly flying is easier than walking on the water isn't it jesus can suddenly appear in that boat do you don't you think he is able to do that yes jesus is able to suddenly appear in the boat of the disciples he can fly like a eagle and can come that is much faster then why did he choose to walk on the water the answer is very simple by walking on the water he told the disciples a simple message guys you are scared of this water guys let me tell you you are scared that this water can kill you but look where the water is where was the water it was the un- it was under the foot of jesus christ as jesus was walking on the water he was communicating the message to the disciples saying the waters which are scaring you the waters which you are afraid that they may kill you are they are they are as the, all those waters are under my foot and they cannot overcome you that is the first message jesus gave to the disciples as he appeared on the water similarly as the disciples have locked the doors and were living in the closed rooms he is telling them through his appearance i am with you in your fears and these doors cannot stop me your fears cannot stop me i am with you in your fears that's a message jesus is communicating to them and then immediately he said peace be with you this is a, such a comforting message to the people who denied him who were living in the room close room the disciples of jesus what did they do they have denied jesus you know very well peter denied three times the example we know very uh, we know and if we think about peter only denied jesus then we are uh, you know we are fooling ourselves peter at least denied jesus these people they did not even appear to take the name of jesus they were not even with jesus the moment the soldiers came they ran away okay these people uh, what they did uh, um, the uh, you know in hindi we say na haath de diya hai mujhe you know they have uh, they were not faithful to the friendship of jesus the moment jesus was put in the trouble they ran away okay what would happen if you imagine you ran away from your friend when he was in trouble and he appeared to you again what do you feel we all feel shame and guilty right for them jesus was saying peace be with you i am not here to uh, discuss or i am not here to find why you have left me 
I am not here to uh, make judgments for your denial, but I'm here for you. That's what Jesus communicating as he said the words, peace be with you. And uh, uh, then the interesting thing is he showed them the hands and the sides. If you see, this is quite interesting thing, you know, uh, wherever Jesus appeared, most of the times after the resurrection of Jesus, he has shown his hands and side. Why is he showing his wounds always? You know, the answer is the wounds are real. The wounds only tell who is the true Jesus is. It's an exaggerated story I heard. Uh, there was a, uh, a bishop in the early church. He had a vision where Satan appeared to him in the form of Jesus. Okay. And the moment he has seen the great light, uh, he was uh, uh, terrified. And then uh, the devil spoke as Jesus, but he did not uh, bow down to the, uh, you know, the light or the devil appeared. Then the devil uh, understood why this fellow is not uh, uh, bowing down to me, though I appeared in the form of Jesus. Then the devil asked the bishop, why, uh, you know, why, why are you not worshipping me? Then the bishop said, I know you are devil Satan. You are devil and Satan. I know you are not Jesus. I'm just uh, waiting to, for you to leave. And he said, how did you know that I'm not Jesus? And the bishop said, if you were the real Jesus, you would have the wounds in your hands in the side. The wounds, they speak about our sin. The wounds, they speak about our violence. The wounds, they do speak about the, uh, you know, Jesus giving himself as a sacrifice for our violence and for our sin. And he has forgiven us. The wounds do speak about our sin and they do speak about our violence. That is the reality. And uh, I was wondering, these wounds will never heal. Uh, uh, they will never be healed or what? The answer is, uh, later I realized, the wounds in the scripture they have shown and they depicted wounds not to tell us, uh, not to tell that Jesus' wounds are not healed, but to tell that our sin is real, our broken condition was real, and Jesus and his salvation was real. So whenever we look at wounds, wounds, not wounds, excuse me, uh, wounds, they do speak about assurance of our salvation. So Jesus appeared uh, and he has shown his wounds to them. And surprisingly, this is the second time he says, peace be with you. Just look, within two sentences, again, he used the word peace be with you. He can say once that's enough, right? Why this second time? That is where the crux of the story remains. The importance of this incident remains. He says, peace be with you. And this time, why did Jesus say peace be with you? It is because... He is going to give them a mission. He is going to give them a task. And in that task, for that task, he is saying, peace be with you. In other words, I am with you. In other words, don't be afraid to do this task. And what is the task he had given? And that we will see further. And as he was giving the task, before that, one thing he did that is uh, recorded in, uh, uh, in the same passage where it is written. And with that, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. And with that, he breathed on them and said, oh, sorry, two times I wrote, uh, receive the Holy Spirit. And you know, Holy Spirit very well. The Holy Spirit is the power that has created everything. In the Eden of garden, when God uh, formed man out of the mud, he breathed into them the living breath of God. In other words, he breathed into them the Holy Spirit and the mud has become a living person, which tells God has breathed his life into, into us. He breathed uh, the spirit which was hovering over the uh, sea, uh, sea and uh, over the, uh, sorry, during the creation, the spirit was hovering over the sea, which tells us his presence, which speaks about uh, the creative presence of God himself. And now he is giving the creative presence of God. And now he is giving the creative power of God. Now he is giving the spirit that gives life and he breathed it upon his disciples. And then he gives the mission to them and said, if you forgive 
uh, anyone's sins, that sins are forgiven you. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven, which is, I am giving you my spirit through which I am expressing my forgiveness to you and you go do the same. And he said, as the father has sent me, I am sending you into the world. To do what? To share the good news of forgiveness of Jesus. This is actually John. Uh, uh, John uh, always he writes his um, whatever he wants to communicate. No, he makes it more personalized and communicates. Okay, Jesus said, "Go and tell the world about my forgiveness." Okay, and John personalized it and said, "I forgive others as God has." forgiven you. Can you see how the writing skills of John? If you, if you compare it with other gospel, you will understand most of the things. John, he communicates in such a way which is more personalized. And this is one among them. Jesus said, as the Father sent me, I'm sending you into the world. And then said, go, forgive people whom you forgive, they are forgiven. Whom you did not forgive, they are not given. So which tells God has breathed his spirit into us. The spirit of his power he breathed upon us and he sent us into the world to, ex to share the same message that Jesus had shared in the closed room 2000 years ago. What is the message he shared? The message of forgiveness. That is the incident that happened in 2000 uh, years ago. Let us look at our situation. Is the church inside the door still? I would say, even if AC is not on, the church is inside the doors. Okay? Church has closed their doors. And we asked the question before, there is power in the name of Jesus. There is power in the blood of Jesus. Is there power in the body of Jesus? The answer is yes. If Jesus' name itself has power, what about his body? Definitely the body of Jesus has power. But the problem is, the body of Jesus has been domesticized. What is the first step of domesticizing? We all know about wild animals. We go to zoos and see, right? What is the first step people do in domesticizing them? Locking them inside. You bring a lion, lock it inside. Don't let it go outside <coughs> into the jungle. Give the food. What happens? It will be. It will become a domestic pet. No matter if it's a lion, tiger, or whatever it is. If you lock it and provide what it wants, it will be domesticized and it will become a pet. And now, the church also being domesticized. Church also being locked inside. We are living in the lock, with the locked doors. It can be because of fear. Maybe because of uh, the fear of pandemic. Haven't we locked our doors? We did because of fear of pandemic. Haven't we locked our doors because fear of the insecurity of minorities? Haven't we locked our doors because what people may think once upon a time in childhood, we used to carry our Bibles and go to church. Okay. And uh, uh, of course, I'm not judging anyone here. We have scripture. We are projecting on the screen. That's why we are not bringing. Please don't be, uh, don't feel uncomfortable as I say this. But now we find it very difficult and we find it shame, shameful and we feel shy to carry our Bibles as we go to church. It can be uh, children as they go to school, they feel like, you know, if I carry my Bible, my friends make fun, they make fun of me. And employees, if they speak the name Jesus, my, I don't know if my, uh, uh, my co-workers may feel offended. That's why we don't want to speak about Jesus. And we don't want to speak about Jesus with our neighbors. Sometimes we don't talk, even talk about Jesus with our own families because the families have divided so much now. Even within the family, there are so many perspectives. There are atheists in the families. There are different religions in the family. families. I'm not talking about speaking about Christian religion. I'm talking about speaking about Jesus and his love and forgiveness. If we are not speaking, that means we have locked our doors 
and we are sitting inside the church. We are domesticizing the church now. And do you know this? 87% of uh, churches are unwilling to go out in the modern day. 87% of the churches. And 87% uh, percent of uh, churches, they want to do their programs only for their church. I don't know if uh, Clement and Ravi would like to give me my salary this month, but let me tell you the truth. 87% of the churches, they, they don't like to spend money for outreach. Okay. Uh, so Clement is quiet and I'm sorry. <laughs> Uh, so we also need to think about it. Are we allotting something for the outreach? If not money, are we ready to allot our time? Are we ready to share our resources for the people outside? If we are not, we are domesticizing the church. We need to think about that. And we are denying Jesus. That is we deny by not witnessing. But he offered his mercy and saying, peace be with you. If we are not witnessing Jesus, we are denying him. And there is a word, uh, this is in a hyperbole. Jesus said, whoever, um, whoever um, you know, upholds my name in front of the people, I will uphold them in front of my father. Whoever denies my name before the people, I will deny them in front of my father. This is a word that Jesus has spoken. This is an hyperbole, okay? The main message, what Jesus wanted to communicate to us is, I want that you should take my name. I want that you should speak about me. If we don't speak about Jesus, if we don't evangelize, we are domesticizing the church and we are ripping the church out of his power. But still Jesus says, peace be with you. He showed them his hands and side. If you look at in the modern day, uh, again, the wounds of Jesus, they remind us the reality of your sin and my sin and the reality of our violence and it is showing about Jesus' forgiveness. And again, Jesus said, peace be with you. We may be in the troubled situation. As I said, Jesus said, peace be with you as he's uh, asking the disciples, as he's commissioning the disciples to go and witness for him. He say, he's saying the same message to us. As the Father has sent me, I'm sending you into the world, but don't be afraid I am with you. Maybe, I guess we need to be intentional about speaking about Jesus outside. I understand we have fears, so many fears, fears of the society, fears of the politi uh, uh, politicians and religion, so, uh, whatever, uh, whatever is around us, we are scared about them. And uh, I don't want to tell you or challenge you to move with faith in this. I would like to challenge you to move with fear also because God is faithful enough to turn your fears into faith. And that's what happened in my life. And I would like to encourage the church also to do the same. And uh, he breathed on them the Holy Spirit. And he said, receive the Holy Spirit. And now you and I have received the Holy Spirit. Don't you think so? You and I have received not just on us, but we have the Holy Spirit within us. Colossians chapter 1 verse 27 says, the, uh, the mystery which has been hidden from ages to ages, now it is revealed to his holy apostles. That is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Christ is in you. The Holy Spirit is in us. So we don't need to be feared and we should move forward. We have received the power of the Holy Spirit. And uh, now Jesus had given us, this is also in a hyperbole. He said, whomever you forgive, they are forgiven. Whomever did not, you did not forgive, they are not forgiven, which is another time statement of saying, extend the forgiveness, extend the gospel I have given you to others. You, as you have received it, you will say, send it, you share it with others. Uh, I would like to bring before you, uh, just remind you about uh, a parable, uh, and then I will uh, go towards the closing. You all know about the parable where uh, your master gives 
certain talents to one uh, one talent to one two talents to another person five talents and goes uh, into far country and comes back the person who received five talents invested and he got 10 the person who invested two go he earned two more and the person who got one he dug it dug uh, dug and uh, saved it under the ground and he did not he brought it and said i know uh, you will reap where you did not so that's why i have saved your money and he returned to him he said uh, you're, you're unfaithful servant and he he expressed his punishment upon him but look at these two servants who received five talents and two talents what is this that they have invested we talk about talents and we think that these talents are talking about the skills we got these talents is not skills we got. This talent is a measurement, which means a heavy thing, a great thing. What is the greatest thing that God has given to us? Nothing but the grace of God, the forgiveness of God. Now, let me tell you, the grace of God and forgiveness of God, they are such in nature, as much as you spend, as much as you invest, it will become double. You invest love, it will become double. You invest forgiveness, it will become double. You, in, you express grace, it will become double. That is the nature of the gift we have received. And the same thing God is asking us here. I have given you immense quantity of forgiveness, mercy, and grace to you. Now you go and express it. When we, once we do that, what happens? It will be doubled. So that's what God wants us to do. But unfortunately, what are we doing? We are switching on ACs and closing our doors. We got stuck inside the doors and we have been domesticized. The church has been domesticized because church is not going out now. Let me show you the power of body of Christ. The power of Christ is the power of body of Christ. Matthew chapter 16, verse 19, it says, And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. Jesus did not say the gates of Hades shall not prevail against me. He said the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it, which means the church. The gates of Hades cannot prevail against us. If they cannot prevail against us, what outside can prevail against us? Can you think about it? If gates of Hades cannot, what can prevail against us? So the power of Jesus is the power of the church. And the power of the Holy Spirit is the power of the body of Christ. Acts chapter 1 verse 8, it says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit is, when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witness in Jerusalem and in Judea, Samaria and the ends of the world. When we receive the Holy Spirit, we receive the power. Did you experience that power? Okay. And let me tell you what it, the, the Holy Spirit is not given to us so that we may just speak in tongues or we may heal or perform miracles. The primary purpose the Holy Spirit given to us is to witness. When you receive the power, you will witness. That's what Jesus said. And the disciples did receive the Holy Spirit and they witnessed. So, Sometimes we feel, I don't feel the power of God. Let me tell you uh, a simple trick. If you want to experience the power of God, go out and talk about Jesus with somebody. If you want to experience the power of God, if you could not go out, at least talk to somebody in your home about Jesus. Talk to some of your friends about Jesus. Then you will experience the power of, uh, power of Jesus in a tangible manner. And could we could we experience the power of Jesus now? Are we experiencing it? Or we have domesticized now? Things have become so common to us. We don't feel any power. We don't express any power. And because I said, if you want to experience the power of God, you go and talk about Jesus. I said, why? Because the scripture says in Romans chapter 1, verse 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God. When you talk about the gospel, you are talking about the power. When you talk about the gospel, you are experiencing the power. So if you want to experience the power of God, you talk about the gospel. If you want to experience or you want to share the power of God with someone, talk about Jesus. So... The power of the gospel is the power of the body of Christ. 
So we don't need to be shut down. We don't need to live inside the closed doors. Jesus is stepping inside our closed doors and telling you, peace be with you. And in great commission, he said, I am with you. So in conclusion, what I would like to say is uh, from scripture, Romans chapter 10, verse 10 to 14. Apostle Paul writes, he is quoting uh, the prophet Isaiah. How then can they call on the one they have not believed? And how can they believe in the one of whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can anyone preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring the good news. How the people in the world can experience the power of Jesus. How they can experience the power of the Spirit. How can they can experience the power of the body of Christ? The answer is very simple. We stepping out of the closed doors and talking about Jesus. When we talk about Jesus, we will be releasing, we will be exercising the power of the church and church would not be any more, it won't be, it won't become a domestic church anymore, but it will become uh, a dynamic church because when we go out and speak about Jesus, the power of Jesus, dynamos, which means a great power of explosion, that would be released the moment we speak about Jesus. It's not necessary that you need to take placards and say, believe in Jesus. It can be a random act of love. It can be, you know, in your own ways, in your own creative methods, we talk about Jesus' forgiveness. And so what I would like to close is with uh, saying, let the church voice heard and the power revealed in the world. May the Lord encourage our congregation to become strong, to be his witnesses in the world, in the community, in the, wherever we are working. We will, and would like to encourage the church. We are desiring for a growth. A healthy church, a, church, a living body either grows or dies, but it will never remain the same. A plant either grows or dies, but it will never remain the same. If anything uh, is not growing, it is uh, destined to die. So I would like to encourage church, let us be intentional to be alive let us be intentional to reveal the power of church in the community. Thank you so very much. I would like to ask Vijay to play the closing song.